This is not the small print of the gospel. This is not some hidden message in scripture. Jesus made it very clear that a decision to follow was a decision to die, to surrender everything to him. And so Jesus turns to the crowd and he turns to you and me and he asks the one question that will ultimately define our lives. Are you a fan or a follower? our final message in this Not A Fan series, and you know it has been a challenging series for me as I, I know it has been from several of you as well. Uh, so this is our final, I think it's been great being able to talk about during the message, the same thing that we're communicating during connect groups during the week and how that kind of merges together. We have one more official meeting of our Not A Fan Connect group this week. And uh, after that, our group is planning on meeting again, and uh, who knows after that, just to keep that connectivity. And uh, after this officially begins, there's going to be kind of a break, and then we're going to resume groups our next semester, May 1st, and we're doing that through using Financial Peace University, Dave Ramsey's financial course, and we're hopefully going to do two nights, a Tuesday and a Thursday, where we can come back together and learn some principles uh, from Scripture about uh, the management of God's money. And uh, so mark your calendars for that. Another big event, we're going to do a pictorial directory. Uh, Easter is on April the 8th. And uh, after that, and mark your calendars for that too, but after that, at the end of the month, like 26, 27, 28th, we're going to have a pictorial directory. We're going to get a free 8 by 10 free uh, booklet. And also, we are promised no pressure on purchasing uh, picture packages, and we're going to hold them to that. And uh, so uh, make sure to mark your calendars down for that. And we have uh, with us uh, Michael and Nancy Gray, the founding minister here, who we're engaging in this 90 days of prayer. And uh, just they've set everything up and, and just kind of waiting for that May 31st event and uh, just be praying and lifting them up during that time. Those are just some of the highlights. Follow us on Facebook so we can get up-to-date information on what we're doing. And uh, the theme of our Not A Fan series, if anybody wants to stand up and quote it, it's Luke 9, 24, right? 9, 23. Okay, I was just kind of trying to trick you a little bit. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, <laughs> he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And uh, that is indeed what we want to do. And uh, I just ask if you'd pray with me as we begin today. Father, we thank you for your mercies. We thank you for putting it in blunt terms what it means to be a follower and not just a fan. And I pray for what we are planning as your people, that you would honor that and bless that. And pray particularly about two things, that, that uh, Michael and Nancy's mission to New Zealand, Father, that you would bless that, that you would bless them in this end time where they're making the transitions necessary with they and their family to get on the mission field, to preach your word, that we do that here, that we do that around the world. And I pray that you would energize them as our missionaries. And Father, young Andre, with the leukemia, he's uh, still going in, in intensive care, and he's trying to figure out what's going on with the infection, that he's doing better today. I pray, Father, that we would continue to lift him up. I pray in this final message, as we go in this final week about defining our relationship with you, that we would understand what it means what the difference is between being a fan and a follower. I pray that you would use the words, your scriptures today to touch our hearts and speak to us the way that we need to be, that we need to, to hear. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. By way of intro, I want to just kind of talk about food a little bit. You know, it's getting about lunchtime. And uh, we recently did a 21 days of devotion with prayer and fasting where we uh, really determined to be a people of prayer. And, uh, you know, I, uh, during that 21 days, did some, some partial fasting, but for four days I went without food, just water. And on that fourth day, I woke up, and I was so focused on food, I knew what I wanted to eat when I came off of this fast. And when you go without eating for a prolonged period of time, it makes you think differently. It makes you maybe engage in irrational behaviors. I've read stuff where people have not had food in extreme situations. I mean, serious, where people have died. And people have resulted to cannibalism as well, just to feed themselves. Well, 
the same is kind of true spiritually. When we aren't fed spiritually, people act out and engage in irrational thinking and irrational behavior sometimes because just as we have this satisfaction when we are fed physically, we need to be fed to have that same contentment spiritually as well. And today we're going to look at a story in John chapter 6 that describes a, poop, a group of people who were hungry. And in this moment that Jesus is teaching them, they kind of have a DTR, a defining moment in their relationship where they were challenged to go beyond the physical, the physical needs, to look at their spiritual needs. And this, this passage in John chapter 6 is... Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is what that's about. That's the only uh, miracle recorded of Jesus other than the resurrection that's recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, we're really going to focus on what happens after the feeding of the 5,000, which probably doesn't give a whole lot of attention. And I hope that it will further clarify the distinction that we've been talking about through this series, to ask ourselves in defining our relationship with our Lord and Jesus Christ, are we a fan or are we just or just a fan, or are we a follower? And the first point I want to look at in the text is fans always want more. Fans always want more. And verse 5 in chapter 6 of the book of John says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Fans always ask, What's it cost? Jesus was sensitive, however, to these people's physical needs. You know, there wasn't a famine in the land at the time. There wasn't difficulty in getting food at that time. But these people had missed a couple of meals. And Jesus knew what it was like to go without food. I mean, he'd fasted for 40 days as well at one particular occasion. And Jesus was concerned about these people's needs. So he asked one of the disciples, you know, what do you think we ought to do? And he asked Philip in particular, and in verse 6, it says in the Bible that he asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered this in verse 7. Philip answered, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of these guys to have just a bite. Now, fans ask, how much is it going to cost? And we do the same thing today. Jesus says, follow me. And we say, how much is it going to cost? How much time is it going to take? What's the minimum requirement, Lord? He says, lead my church. Well, as long as it doesn't interfere with something else. How much is it going to cost me? And Philip determined it's going to require eight months' wages to feed this group of people. But the text goes on to say that Andrew spoke up in verse 9. And Andrew says it may be something like this. Well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish, but how far will they go among so many? Some commentators think that he was being a little sarcastic. Matthew records the event, and the response of the disciples say that just send the people away. Let them go back to the villages and get their own food. But Jesus was concerned about the physical needs of this crowd. And in verse 10 we read, that Jesus said, have the people sit down. Verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Every time we read in Scripture when Jesus is having a meal, he gives thanks for that. And uh, he gave thanks for this, this loaf and the, these fish, and he starts handing it out to the disciples and he starts handing it out to the disciples. And he starts handing it out to the disciples because this food just keeps coming out of these baskets because Jesus performed this dramatic miracle. Verse 12 says, when they, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the leftover pieces. Now, my mom thinks this is the biblical precedent for eating leftovers. <laughs> and these guys probably ate leftovers for days. But there's a deeper hunger that Jesus came to satisfy. He didn't just come to satisfy our physical need. He came to satisfy the spiritual needs of our soul. And I think Jesus was more concerned 
about these people's spiritual need. I think Jesus knew, had he said, as Matthew records, go back and get some food, that maybe the people would have never come back. And he wanted to keep them there to teach them a little bit longer before they might turn away. So I think Jesus met their physical needs temporarily so they'd come and listen. And they did initially. So here's the setting. After dinner the night before, they're all fed, they all eat, they camp out, they get up next, the next day, they're, they're looking for Jesus, and you know, they get up and they're hungry. And they look around for Jesus, a.k.a. their meal ticket, and they, he's nowhere to be found. And they search it out, and they, they found out that he's gone to the other side of the lake. And so instead of going home, they act like followers. They pick up and they follow Jesus. They appear to be more than just fans. And by the time they catch up with Jesus, they're starving, they're hungry, there's no McDonald's to stop in. And they've missed a chance to order breakfast. And they're excited to find out what's on the lunch menu. But Jesus decided to shut down the all-you-can-eat buffet, and he's not handing out any more free samples. And in verse 26, we read that Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Verse 35 continues. Then Jesus declared, you know, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never go thirsty. And the people were going, what? You're not going to feed us? I think we're a little hungry here, Jesus. I mean, you just did this miracle. And the Bible says that these people began to grumble. Look over in verse, verse 47. Verse 47 says, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. These people had experienced this dramatic miracle of Jesus. They were fed. They had their physical needs met. But Jesus came to satisfy the soul, and they didn't want to hear that because they wanted this Savior who could feed them, this quick-fix Savior. And there are those, I think, today that are looking to find in Jesus somebody who will just meet their physical needs. I'll leave that there. <laughs> and you know what? They come to church when they're hurting because they're seeking a relationship they want some remedy for their family troubles. Maybe there's tragedy in their life, and people come to see Jesus for hope. We have people all the time who call into the church office, and they're wanting some help, some assistance financially. I had once somebody's request turned down, and they were really upset at me, and they said, isn't that what the church is supposed to do? And this crowd of people just wanted a meal ticket from Jesus. Another meal to have their physical needs met. But Jesus came to satisfy this deeper and strong need of satisfying our soul. So there is this spiritual nature within us that needs to be filled that Jesus was teaching. And this crowd totally missed that aspect of their being that day. So I want to kind of try to illustrate what that makes up, and I want to just say first that we are spiritual beings with a soul. God created us in his image, therefore we're sp sp spiritual beings and physical beings. First Thessalonians says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I can easily distinguish between my body and my inner spirit, but it's difficult to divide that spirit and soul, you know, when God created Adam. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul, a living being. Now, animals have a spirit, but they don't have a soul. And when you, know, when you go to a funeral and somebody's passed on, you know that their body's there. It's empty. Their spirit, their soul has gone on to be with the Father. But man is more than just a physical being. They're, we're made in the image of God. There is a spiritual, natural spiritual connection to God. And our spiritual nature is that we crave spiritual food. I mean, after Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days, the Satan came and tempted him and said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus repeated back to him, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There is a spiritual dimension about our life 
that needs to be fulfilled and filled. The French philosopher Pascal said there's a God-shaped hole in every heart that only God can fill. We read in the Bible during this series that the rich young ruler came to Christ and he said, I've done everything, I'm still lacking something. What is it? It's that God-shaped hole <coughs> that God's created us with. And some people have just about have everything in the world, but they're still lacking something. They're still missing something. There's this, still, there's this hole inside because there is this spiritual thing going on, this craving for God that they've not filled. The psalmist said, as the deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you, O God. And just like physical hunger, when we have that spiritual need that's not met, we do some irrational things sometimes to try to fill that. There is a passage of scripture in Amos chapter 8, beginning with verse 8, or beginning with verse 11, that reads like this. I mean, listen to this. The days are coming, declares the Lord declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine throughout the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. When Steve Fawcett was trying to go around the globe in this big balloon this one particular time, he crash landed in India and there he's hanging in the trees, and these people in this third world country in this remote area saw him hanging there and thought the balloon was a temple, and they worshipped him as their monkey god. People do some strange things in third world countries when they are searching to fill that God-shaped hole, that spiritual void that's in every person. But it's not just third world countries. We do it right here in America because we're spiritually starved. And there are people who act out and do different things, everything from drugs to grasping at straws when they're creating these new religions. You know, I just think of the Church of Scientology as one example of that. This is kind of the, the church to the elite, to those of the Hollywood ilk. It's supposed to be an intellectual type of a, a religion. And you know you read about that. And uh, I want to read something from the founder, L. Ron Hubbard, something that he wrote uh, that he aspires to, and he says this, what is true for you is what you have observed yourself, and what they really kind of think that man's good, and really they think they can figure out everything on their own, and he says, and when, when you lose that what you observe yourself, you've lost everything, he says. What you know is what you know, and to have the courage to know and say what you have observed. Have observed. Of course, we can talk about honor and truth, and all of these things these eso in esoteric terms, but I think they all would be covered very well if what we really observed is what we observed, that we took care to observe what we are observing and that we are always observed to observe. Now, I could read more than that, but that's about as good as it gets. <laughs> and that's what people are aspiring to. They're so spiritually starved. It reminds me of the guy who said, when men cease to believe in God... It's not that they don't believe in nothing, it's that they'll believe in anything. And men stagger from sea to sea, from north to east, searching to find something to fill that God-shaped hole. And part of that spiritual aspect of us is that Christ alone is the only one who can satisfy and fill our deepest spiritual need. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Theologian Paul Tillich said there are three needs that are... They've got to be met by the inner man that only Christ can satisfy. The need for forgiveness of sin, the need for purpose in life, and the need for hope beyond the grave. And Jesus' death on the cross satisfies that. It gives us the forgiveness of sin. It gives us the hope beyond the grave and the purpose for life. That's why Dale Evans said, I searched all my life for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but I found everything that I needed at the foot of the cross. Because Jesus Christ satisfies not just this crowd's physical hunger, but he wanted to, fight to satisfy their spiritual need as well. But fans always want more. And secondly, Jesus offers what we really need. And then some. When Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you find out that he's the only one you're really hungry for. When there's no other options out there, when there's no place else to go, you find out that Jesus really is enough. I, uh, 
uh, one morning there was a group of kids, uh, this was years ago, in our church. Instead of coming to church that morning, they decided to go four-wheeling. One of the kids had a, a flipped his four-wheeler. He couldn't move. I was called and went to the emergency room. By the time I got there, it was determined that he had been paralyzed from the waist down. And I walked in and saw him completely immobilized. And when I walked over near him, he turned his eyes toward me with tears running down the corner of his eyes. He said, I've had a lot of time to think today. And he said, you know, everything that I think used to be important just isn't as important anymore. And it was easy for Andy to be a fan and to come to church when it was convenient, to come to church when he was having difficulties, to come to church when his friends came to church. But that day, he had a defining moment in defining his relationship with Jesus Christ. And when he talked to me that day, we talked about that and what it meant, what it could mean for him to talk with his friends, the, a whole emergency room of friends waiting and praying for Andy to be okay. And every time he started talking about Jesus, that tear would trickle out of the corner of his eyes. You know why? Because Andy understood, like no other time, that Jesus was the only thing that would satisfy his genuine hunger. And that's what changes people from fans to followers. And I could recount many stories as unique as there are individuals. Stories about the daughter that's diagnosed with cancer, the parents that get divorced, the addiction that seems unbeatable, the future that seems so overwhelming, the relationships that fall apart. Something happens. Something Something happens that knowing that having a little bit of religion just isn't good enough anymore, that having the spectacle of the, the loaves and the fish to happen to go to church on Sunday just doesn't cut it. And it's in those moments and those times when Jesus is the only thing on the menu, they find out that Jesus is the only thing that I really need. That Jesus is somebody more than just a crucifix, something more than somebody walking around with a purple or blue sash that he is somebody who can offer us genuine hope. So here in John 6, the crowd has to decide, is Jesus my meal ticket? Or is Jesus all that I really need? So after Jesus feeds the crowd, and he starts talking about the spiritual aspect of living, here is the response of the crowd. And it's always been kind of funny to me to see that it is John, it's John chapter 6, verse 66, if that means anything to you. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. In the long run, that's what's going to happen. Scripture tells us that the road is wide that leads to destruction, and in the end, whether we like it or not, people aren't just going to accept Jesus for who he is. They're not going to accept him as the one who can satisfy their deepest spiritual needs. They like the idea of heaven. They like the miracles. They like the bread. They like the free show. They like the excitement. They like, they like the crowds. But when Jesus wipes off all the table and just offers up himself, some will just turn away. And after we read that the, these fans all walk away, Jesus turns to his closest disciples, the twelve, and he says this in verse 67. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. I don't know how he said that. I don't know if he said it with, with anger. I don't know if he said it with deep frustration or emotion. My guess is that he spoke with a tone of hurt, of disappointment, of sadness, because all these people that were following him now turn away, and just the 12 apparently are there. And even though it was God, it had to have broken his heart. I mean, think about this just for a minute. How would you feel if you started to date somebody and you took them on a date and you go out to the movies and you pay for the popcorn, you buy the snacks, you buy the tickets and you sit down and you enjoy the movie and you have a good time. And after that, you've had such a good time, you ask them out on a date again, and they say, yeah, and you go, cool, man, there's something's going on here. And you take them to a fine restaurant, something better than McDonald's. And you say, you can choose anything off the menu that you want. 
And when the bill comes, you pay for that. You pay for the, you, you just pay for it all. And you know what? You start feeling there's this real connection. And you have a couple of more dates. And then you decide, you know what? I'm going on a special date. You ask them out, they accept, and you go to a walk in the park. And you walk with them, and you find a park bench in this serene, beautiful, romantic setting. And you sit down, and you just pour out your heart to this person. And you tell them how you feel. And how you feel there's this real connection. And they look at you quizzically, and they go, Is this the date? When are we going to get to the good stuff? How's that going to make you feel? When you realize that they're just hanging around for the things. They're just hanging around for the meal, for the excitement. Wouldn't that break your heart? And I think that's probably how Jesus felt. So he asked his disciples, these rabbis in training, whether, are you guys going to leave too? Are you guys just going to be fans? Are you going to stick with me and be followers? I know the teaching's getting kind of tough. I'm kind of laying it on the line. But are you going to abandon me too? And here's the response, and it's typical that it would come from Peter at this point. Verse 68 says, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? <laughs> you have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And this is point B if you're writing that down. When you really know that Jesus is Lord, you don't want to leave him. And I think Peter's answer summed it up. To whom shall we go? That one question asks so many questions. To whom shall we go? Lord, who else has the words of eternal life? Why would we reject the Messiah? Lord, who else are we going to follow? Who else is out there? Who else out there has the hope that you have to offer? Who else can teach the scriptures like you teach? Who else can we follow who is compared to you? You see, fans bail when the conversation gets tough, when we don't understand what's being said sometimes. To pick up a cross, to deny my needs, to die to self. And I don't think it's just because they preferred comfort. I mean, these guys had their meal ticket paid for. They'd gotten the popcorn. They'd gotten the movie. They'd gotten the free show. It's not just about comfort like we've talked about before. The point is there's no real connection. There's no real relationship. I mean, if you really knew that you 100% sure we're going to go to heaven when you died, if you were 100% sure that Jesus is the Son of God, that you were 100% sure that you're going to experience joy in heaven, I can't imagine anyone not sticking with that. Can you? Why wouldn't anybody accept that offer? If we all knew with every ounce of our being, I think we'd have a much more simple time Understanding the difficult things when God says, pick up your cross, deny yourself, watch how you handle yourself, watch your words, watch your actions. If all of us believe the way the disciples believed and accepted Jesus with all that passion that they had, if we knew without a doubt that Jesus is Lord, I think we'd approach Jesus and evangelism in a very different way. But here's the problem, point C, we don't know the way we wish so we don't believe the way we should. Let me repeat that. We don't know the way we wish, so we don't believe the way we should. The first half of that's tough. I think some people, the fans, aren't really sure that Jesus is Lord. I mean, there's evidence both pro and against. And the bottom line is, is that we really don't know for sure, do we? Because we'd like to have it all laid out on our terms. Wouldn't we? Don't we wish God would just write it out in the sky, something extra than the Bible? Don't we wish he'd give me a vision, speak to me audibly? Wish he'd send me a private angel, just give me some unmistakable sign, Lord, that you are in charge, that all this stuff that you say is 100% true, but life's not like that. It wasn't like that for the disciples either. Yeah, they saw miracles. But in this defining moment when Jesus said, are you going to leave too? They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, there was no place else to turn. And choosing to know that and to believe that and practice that and follow that is a choice that we've got to make just like the disciples because if we believed in their same passion, we wouldn't turn away either and that would make such an impact on our living day to day. That would make such an impact on our church, on our community, on our world 
if we believe that with the passion in which the disciples believe that. In the end, it comes down to this, whether or not you believe Jesus is who he says he is. And that defines your relationship with him. Are you going to remain a fan or are you going to be a follower? We're going to listen to Kyle Eidelman to explain that a little better. Hebrews 9.27 says, Man is destined to die once, and after that to face the judgment. Those are the two guarantees. We will all die and we will all stand before God. When that moment comes to all of us, there's only one question that will really matter, is have you decided to follow Jesus? If I could, I would ask you that question differently because it's very personal. I wish I could come over to your house and knock on your door. Hopefully I could talk you into letting me come in and sit down for a few minutes. And I would want to sit across the kitchen table from you and look you in the eye and ask you this question. I know that when you hear me ask, have you decided to follow Jesus, many of you quickly nod your head yes and say, yeah, I'm a follower. But why do you say that? Because I'm not asking if your parents were followers. I'm not asking if you've prayed a prayer. I'm not asking if you say grace before meals or if you come to church. I'm not even asking if you believe in Jesus. I am asking, are you a follower of Jesus? Because one day there are many who say, I am a follower that will stand before God and be declared fans. I want to conclude with this statement. We don't know the name, but we do know his name. One day, our life's going to end, whether we get sick and die, or whether the Lord will return. And even though we don't know that day, we do know his name, the Savior who promises that I can grant you eternal life. And I know that none of us on the day of judgment, we do not want to be declared a fan and for Christ to say, I never knew you, depart from me. But Jesus guarantees, if you put your trust in me, if you believe in all of this that I've given to you, he guarantees that you can stake your life on that promise. He guarantees that if you put your trust and faith and hope in him, that he'll guide you to an eternity forever with the Father. We don't know the day, but we do know his name. And the scripture says by his name alone, we are saved. Not from the messed up lives that we might live, but he grants us and promises that if we decide to follow Jesus, will we be a fan or declared a follower. Followers who say, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One sent from God. Would you pray with me? Would you stand with me and pray? Father, we come before you today and the scriptures are laid bare. And it's been intriguing to kind of to, to parse fan and follower. And Father, you challenge us so much with your scripture, with those who've been challenged in the past. And what really boils down to is today is, you know, am I going to continue to live life the way that I'm doing it? Or am I going to accept the way that you've offered it. To come to you, to trust in you, to know that there's more to this world than maybe frail bodies, that yea, one day, that it's 100% true that we'll walk again if we've never walked, that we'll talk or have sight if we've never seen or spoken. 
that we can believe that it's true. Where else is there to go? Do we want to wander from sea to sea or north to east? No. I know we're imperfect, but you are perfect. I pray, oh God, today that if there is one or many that want to follow you in a deeper way, that they would do that, that there are those here that could help along the way if they need prayer. If they've never, if there's one here that's never decided, that they've never, if they've never even been baptized into you and said, I believe you, Lord, that they would begin that walk right today, that they would come to somebody in the back as we sing this song and talk about that, that we could help every step of the way to be the church that we should be. I pray, oh God, that we would make that decision today and every day to pick up our cross, to deny ourselves, and believe you 100%. I pray today that we would make that decision to be a follower. In your name we pray.